Next up, while I love a portmanteau, uh, Melissa, the field CTO at Kong, is going to take us through API ops. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Jennifer, and hello, everybody. I am super excited to be here. Uh, I'm the field CTO at Kong. I've been here about two years, and I was at MuleSoft for five years before that. So in the industry, I've been very much part of defining what an API-first approach means and how to adopt it. There's a trend that I've been seeing recently. I work across uh, customers globally at Kong, um, and I've surveyed hundreds of people at events, and my data tells me that 80% of API teams right now are trading off between the delivery speed and quality of their APIs. The approaches that we took in the past to become API driven just aren't scaling anymore as our landscapes and as our requirements are changing. And this session is all about that. We're going to look at how we could automate the API lifecycle with API ops to give you speed and quality at scale. Let me start off by welcoming you to Acme. This is a large fictional bank with a sprawling tech landscape. The company has been around for several decades, so as many others, they've got a lot of legacy systems and tools and multiple siloed engineering teams. As part of their digital transformation, they're migrating most of their workloads to the cloud and to Kubernetes like everybody is, and they're adopting more of a consistent API-driven approach. And in fact, the mortgages team has just identified the next API they need to build. Emily's just finished designing it, and she's reviewing the spec with her team. And they all agree it looks great. So as per their normal process, she sends it off to the API platform team for review, and she moves on to her next task. The API platform team owns Acme's API platform, as well as their overall architecture. They host and manage the platform on behalf of the rest of Acme with the goal of raising the overall engineering standards across the organization with reusable APIs. A group of them meet once a week to go through all the new APIs that have been submitted and they check them for standards. Sadly, in this case, Emily spec is not approved. It turns out that there's this whole set of standards that Emily just doesn't know about. They're probably documented somewhere at some point, but probably out of date. And they're certainly not very well communicated and not in a developer friendly way. So a week after she submits it for review, the platform team rejects Emily's spec and it gets pushed back down to her. Now, this is pretty embarrassing for Emily. She's getting called out in front of her peers for not doing a good enough job, even though it wasn't really her fault. And this is also a huge waste of everyone's time. Emily is going to have to redo her work. And the platform team are doing these reviews manually at scheduled intervals. So there's several days wasted even just waiting for that review to happen. It's not just Emily and the mortgages team that suffers here either. Acme is following best practice, and they're using a single API platform for global discovery and reuse across the business. And now this means as adoption grows, the platform team needs to support more and more teams across the organization. So then they get more and more APIs coming in for review on top of all the other work that they have to do. So they end up being stretched really thin. Rather than spending enough time fully reviewing every API, they end up having to prioritize. Compliance becomes a nightmare and things start to fall through the cracks which isn't so good for the operations team who are responsible for maintaining the overall IT estate at Acme. Enough has fallen through the cracks, in fact, that there's a lot of errors in production. Nothing is guaranteed to be consistent and deployments are pretty painful. In fact, the ops team refuses to deploy new code more than once a week because it causes so much instability every time. Elsewhere in Acme, the mobile team operates a little differently. This team's goal is building rich digital experiences for Acme's customers as a reaction to all the mobile only banks that are threatening to displace them. So this team has been given a lot of freedom so they can get their applications out as quickly as possible to provide experiences for these customers. They're about to release the latest open banking app. And this one's a big deal for Acme because it's the first time that they're exposing actual API endpoints to customers and partners. Having seen the del delays getting APIs live elsewhere in Acme, the mobile teams decided to do things their own way and they bypassed the API platform team altogether. 
But they were in such a hurry to go live on time that they just focused on the implementation code and they missed some API best practices. And this means that their APIs are inconsistent. They're hard to find, they're hard to access, and they're hard to use. And this puts people off, whether that's internal or external consumers. Their prospects actually are much more likely to go to one of their fintech competitors who know how to treat APIs as products, because this is what makes an API consumable. Making matters worse is the fact that someone in the mobile team forgot to secure one of his APIs when he published it, when he published it. And I see this happening far too many times. This then got exploited and Acme detected a data breach affecting 15 million customer accounts. Acme started off with all the right intentions here, but they've ended up trading off between speed and quality. And this is what I'm hearing time and time again is the biggest pain point in API adoption right now. And I'm interested to know, actually, stick it in the chat. Are you having to make this trade off right now? And is it to prioritize speed or to prioritize quality? So this problem is where API Ops comes in, excuse me. API Ops is the automation of the full API lifecycle. It combines DevOps philosophies when it comes to iterative design and continuous testing with GitOps philosophies in terms of automated declarative deployments. Where before we saw manual, costly and error prone activities at Acme, we're now going to automate all of it. Let's see what this looks like. We know the API lifecycle. This is nothing new. Best practice means that we design an API before we build it. And then once it's deployed, we add governance and operational policies to manage it before making it discoverable to consumers in a portal. And then there's all the ongoing operations and this life cycle continues going round until we retire the API. This is no different with API ops. We're still following best practice, but what you're gonna see is that the processes we follow at each step and between each step have changed. So at design time, we use a design environment like Kong's open source Insomnia to easily create the API spec, which is typically a Swagger or OAS document. And we also create a test suite for that spec. Here we should check several things like, are we getting the responses we expect in certain conditions? Are the responses following the right structure? Now what's critical here is that the tooling we use gives us instant validation. That's linting of the spec against best practices, including your own organizations. The ability to run those tests locally and validate what you're building as you build it. As the designer of the API, you need to have self-serve tooling that makes it easy to do the right thing from the beginning. You don't want to end up like Emily. When you've created the spec and validated it locally, you then push it into Git or whichever version control system you use and you raise a pull request for this new API. Now this triggers a governance checkpoint embedded in our pipeline. Before any time is spent building the API, we need to be sure that what's gonna be built follows our company standards and is aligned with everything else in the ecosystem. So we automatically invoke the API tests that we built earlier and any other governance checks that we wanna include at this stage of the pipeline. For example, are we paginating consistently across many APIs? Like before, there's gonna be checks that the platform owners will want to do for every API that Emily and the other API designers won't have awareness of. But now this is not a manual review, this is automatic, and therefore it's an instant process. In Kong, we enable this through the open source command line tool INSO that validates your specs and runs your tests. If the spec fails any of those tests, it gets automatically pushed back for more work in the design phase. Emily doesn't have to sit around waiting for a response from the platform team. She just gets this instant automatic notification that something needs to change and tells her what. And because this is an automated check embedded in the pipeline and triggered by default when a spec's pushed into Git, it means that there's 100% coverage of these checks for every single API that's being designed anywhere in Acme. So we're now consistently catching errors as close to the beginning of the pipeline as possible. And this means that they're much faster and cheaper to remediate. In fact, it's been estimated that to find and fix a bug now at design time costs 1% of what it would in production. <laughs> 
When the tests pass, then we have a validated spec and we can now progress onto the build phase. And here we build our API in the normal best practice way. We use the spec as the contract to tell us what the API needs to do and what the interface needs to look like. And we use the tests as we go to validate that the API that we're building meets the spec. As before, this will look familiar, when the developer commits their code saying it's ready for deployment, a series of tests are triggered. We automatically execute the tests that we built at design time again to make sure that the API still meets our best practice. These tests are actually our unit tests, and they'll also make sure that the implementation that we just built functions how it should. There'll probably be other tests that we wanna carry out at this stage as well, still automatically. If any of those tests fail, same as before, we know immediately. We do not deploy the API, we go back and we make the necessary changes until our implementation is how we need it. And we can keep executing these tests for continuous validation of what we're doing. When those tests pass, we progress forward to deployment. And now this is where we start to see even more of a GitOps approach because when this round of automated tests has been passed, we then automatically generate the declarative configuration file for this API. And this is one of the central components of GitOps. GitOps is all about declarative rather than imperative ways of managing deployments. It's the modern way of managing infrastructure, really, because it's got so many benefits in terms of accelerated deployment speed, better auditability, better repeatability. Benefits that we need now when we consider the level of scale and complexity compared to a few years ago. For those that aren't familiar with the declarative approach, here's a quick note on it. It's a lot more streamlined than the traditional imperative approach to CI/CD. If we're doing things declaratively, we just specify what we want the end result of something to be. Whereas with imperative, we also have to specify how to get that end result. It's a lot more, as you can see up here. In the context of deployments, if we're implementing CICD the imperative way, we write a script that orchestrates every step that needs to happen, call this admin API, extract that value, use it to call this API, add the policies with that API, and so on and so on. This is a pain to first set up, it's a pain to debug if something goes wrong, and it's a pain to rewrite if and when one of the underlying admin APIs changes. But if we're doing it the declarative way, we don't need to worry about any of that. We just tell the platform what it needs to look like when that API has been deployed, and the platform itself takes care of how that's achieved. And the same is true in API ops. The beauty here is that we shouldn't even need to write that declarative config file ourselves. In tools like Kong, you can automatically generate it from the API spec, so you can have it instantly. And because it's generated from the spec, it'll be completely accurate and consistent with the spec, so you know that nothing will be forgotten about, and there's no chance of human error in that deployment process. So that declarative configuration having been automatically generated as part of the pipeline, instructs the API platform what it needs to look like once the API has been deployed and the platform goes off and magically configures itself. So we end up with our API registered in the platform and with the various security governance and operational policies for that API configured as well. It's also worth noting that we store this declarative config file in version control. I keep saying Git, this doesn't have to be Git. Um, but along with the, the spec, the tests, and the implementation of the API. So you get a complete searchable and auditable history of every deployment you've made. So if ever there's a problem once you've deployed an API, we can very easily roll back to a previous state. So we've not just made deployment easier, but rollbacks as well. Now, of course, once we've deployed the API, we need to validate that it performs how we expect and check that we haven't caused any errors. We're now in an environment where other APIs and other codes have been deployed. So we should do some integration testing, security testing, performance testing, whatever's appropriate, depending on where you're at in your SDLC. So we'll run that series of release checks before we actually publish this API and make it discoverable. These checks should also all be automated, orchestrated from your CI tool, 
Although you may want a final sign off as a manual step before you push that publish button. But when you are ready to publish, then registering the API in the portal, enabling self-serve access, and adding the spec for that API to the portal should be an automated process as well. After all, the only way to ensure that every API is discoverable and documented in the portal is to automate that process. Now, what we've built up as we've gone through the API lifecycle is an inventory of assets that enable us to operate this API on an ongoing basis in an almost entirely self-sufficient way. If we need to scale out the API, for example, to handle higher, higher throughput, that can be completely automated using the declarative config. Since this is version controlled, we'll see a completely repeatable, identical deployment to before. The overall result here, when our API life cycles follow API ops like this, is that the continuous automated testing and deployment means that we can catch and resolve errors and deviations from our standards early, speeding up deployments and raising quality and consistently, consistency. Acme have just adopted API ops. And in the mortgages team, Emily's working on another API. As before, she's following best practice by doing this design first. But unlike before, the tool she's using to create her design gives her instant feedback on it. So she can make sure herself that the spec she's building doesn't violate any policies. She skipped out several days of back and forth with the API platform team getting this right. Instead, it takes her just a few minutes herself. And then once her spec meets standards, she then has the ability to push it directly into Git or whichever version control system you want to use so that it triggers the next part of the automated API ops pipeline. This creates a pull request in Git for the API platform team to then review and to decide whether or not to approve it into the code base or to reject it and send it back to Emily for more work. Life is very different now in the API platform team. They've automated the API review process and applied this to every single API coming in for review. So they have 100% coverage of every quality, security, and compliance check across every single API being built at Acme. This means that their QA costs have gone way down and they're no longer the bottleneck for APIs being deployed. If there was a problem in Emily's spec, she wouldn't have to wait for the next scheduled review session because these automated reviews are triggered whenever a new API has been submitted. But this time, there weren't any issues with Emily's spec. Hurrah! The tool that she's used at design time made it easy for her to do the right thing from the beginning. So the chances of her API meeting Acme standards now is much higher. Once the automated tests have passed, the last step is the automatic generation of the declarative config file from that spec. This is then added to Git and picked up by the operations team. Not that they really have to do much. The API platform configures itself based on the declarative config. It registers the endpoints and applies and configures all the necessary policies as well. So no more forgetting the security. The platform also automatically makes the endpoint discoverable in Acme's portal. So Emily's API is deployed immediately and smoothly. Deployment's much more likely to go smoothly with API ops because A, everything's been tested, so the chance of introducing problems is lower, and B, the, deploy the deployment's completely automated and declarative. In fact, deployments are now so repeatable that the operations team have removed their limit of one a week. They're now deploying in a truly continuous fashion and they can meet the increasing demands as API adoption accelerates across Acme. Of course, there'll still be times when things go wrong, that's unavoidable. But the impact of something going wrong is now much easier to minimize. Since every version of each declarative configuration is in version control, we have a complete history of every deployment. And since these files are all declarative, it's really easy to just revert back to a previous state. The operations team just needs to feed in one of the previous configurations to the platform and it will revert itself back. Things are quite different for API consumers now too. 
Through API Ops, we're ensuring every API is consistently discoverable, secured, documented, and reliable. And this means Acme's portal is now a thing of beauty. It's a catalog of products where each product is a well-designed API. All of this means that Acme can now operate at pace without lowering delivery quality. In fact, they're increasing quality whilst reducing costs, which means that they've got much more resource to innovate than they could before. So they're constantly delivering new capabilities and experiences to their customers. This is the power of API Ops, and it's not just open to companies like Acme. Every single organization can automate the API lifecycle like this if you've got the right API tooling and the right API first mindset. Thank you very much. I know we've still got a couple more minutes for questions. Thank you so much, Melissa. I think we all enjoyed the images, which were super fun cartoons, but also you didn't really have to look at the screen. You could just process the narration you did. So I think it was an excellent storytelling. And I think that's a good example of when we talk about APIs, we get very technical or we get very business, but how to talk across those two silos because that's the point where to connect, right? Yeah. We have a question from the audience that is, what happens if you need to update the API specs when you are midway through the life cycle? So this is, um, this is when the, the life cycle kind of uh, restarts. The life cycle doesn't only exist the first time that you're creating an API. It's like a product life cycle, right? If you need to update the spec, it's because you're creating a new version of the API. So that means you've got a, a, you start the life cycle from the beginning, you design the new version. Obviously it won't take very long since you're making an edit, but you still need to make sure that you validate it, you get feedback on it, you make sure that it goes through the tests to check for standards before you move on to the build phase and implement any changes to the codes to reflect that in the design. So although it looks possibly like there's a lot of steps to this life cycle, it's exactly the same if you're designing, like if you're designing a phone, it's a product, it's got a life cycle, you have a design, you have a prototype, you have a version one of the build. The same for our APIs and for each new version, if we automate the life cycle, it's really not that onerous to follow the life cycle properly each time. Absolutely. And what you're describing, um, I don't think you used the B word, but you were definitely talking about burnout in the API management team, because okay. as the API ecosystem grows, often the API management team doesn't grow and <laughs> needs to. But also, if you automate, that helps it, obviously, and API ops would help. But are there any other ways that before, while they're still working on convincing that they need API ops, that you can recommend that the API management team can limit the amount of time and the amount of burnout that they're going through? Yeah, great question. I see this a lot. And I think it it's still a bit of a, a myth that like microservices and fine-grained APIs make everything easier. They don't, <laughs> they just shift the burden of responsibility onto other teams and it becomes a bit hidden because it's no longer on the developers themselves. Um, it's more on the op side. But things that I've seen work well are to define best practices across the organization, keep them up to date. Don't have like a uh, several page long Word document. I find Confluence sometimes works, but also isn't the most intuitive place to go to view uh, best practices for APIs. What I see make the biggest difference is when you evangelize all of this uh, continuously across the organization. So you've got top-down sponsorship for an API-first approach. People understand, hey, we're making a change and therefore let's give some allowances because change always takes time. And if you evangelize to the people on the ground who are having to make those changes in their day-to-day -day work, if you help them to kind of feel more comfortable with the change, they'll be less resistant to it. They'll get more excited by it. Things I see like um, internal lunch and learns showcasing what uh, an engineer has been able been able to build uh, gamification internally, I find works well. Mm -hmm. And while that does still sound like more work, at least it feels like there's a means to an end where you're 
you're talking to people, which always makes things better. <laughs> and you're, you know, you're, those are important steps to adopting that API app strategy. So thank you so much, Melissa. And I hope you enjoy the rest of API Days London Global.